Um, but if you can go ahead and get um, whatever refreshments you'd like and then have a seat. Well, for this next panel, let me uh, say how, how um, pleased I am and, and honestly, and I couldn't picture a symposium without having a panel of practitioners, you know, editors who uh, are, are sort of the backbone of open access publications. Um, from the, the faculty, you know, the scholar perspective of uh, creating these things. And I've known all three of our panelists in various capacities for years. And I'll say I have tremendous respect for each and every one of them. They're, they're remarkable. You know, the publications that they do uh, are, are some of the longest lived publications in, in the open access movement. And, uh, and I think some of the most successful ones we thought that uh, we could draw on their expertise and, and experience in, well, how do you sustain these things over time? What are our, our good strategies for keeping them going? Let me give you just a little bit of background about them, and then I'll turn it over to them. I'm starting from the far end. Sarah Melton is uh, a PhD. She is the managing editor of Southern Spaces and a PhD candidate in the Graduate Institute of the Liberal Arts at Emory University, my, my alma mater program as well. Um, and um, she is the Digital Projects Coordinator at the Emory Center for Digital Scholarship as well. Her research examines public histories of South African apartheid resistance and the U.S. Civil Rights Movement. And um, she will speak, and we have, I should say, in, in represented in these three panelists, you know, a broad range of disciplinary perspectives from the humanities, the social sciences, and, and the hard sciences. John Nickerson is currently professor and vice director for research in the ophthalmology department at Emory University also, which he joined in 1991. Preceding that, he was a biologist at the National Institutes of Health for 10 years. And um, John's passion and longstanding success in um, molecular vision that you're going to hear about is, I think, uh, probably makes molecular vision, you know, the granddaddy or one of the oldest serving uh, open successful and most successful open access publications around. Uh, Dr. Masood Raja is, um, he, uh, is at UNT and uh, the author of Constructing Pakistan and uh, an associate professor of post-colonial post literature and theory and also the editor of Pakistaniat, which you're going to hear a bit about today. Uh, I will also say that Dr. Raja is a, a passionate advocate for libraries and the work that goes on in libraries and the importance of libraries. And I see many of, of our UNT librarians applauding him up there for all the, the work that he has done in uh, helping advocate for the UNT libraries on our campus. And we are always very grateful to Dr. Raja. He's also the chair of our library committee. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our panelists. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Halbert. And can you hear me in the back? So, um, uh, thank you so much for having me here. And uh, it's, uh, it was really fascinating to hear uh, the editors from some really great presses speak. And, and my own life is kind of uh, a history of these swift transitions from very conventional views on things to sort of very foremost, uh, very altered views on things. So my first career was as a military officer, and now I'm a humanities professor. Uh, I published my first book with probably one of the most established presses in the world, which is the Oxford University Press, but then I became an advocate for open access. So I don't know why I do it. There's probably something wrong in my brain, but I travel from one extreme to another. So Pakistaniyat uh, is uh, a social sciences and humanities journal on Pakistan. That's what basically was, came to my mind when I thought of doing it. When I launched it, the journal was launched in 2009. And so my reasons were pretty simple. Uh, if you remember, those were the years when a lot was happening in the world and a lot was being said about Pakistan, Afghan region. And so I'm originally from Pakistan. Uh, as Walter Manwalo would say, you know, I reside here, but I dwell over there. 
so I felt like there was a need in humanities and social sciences at least to have a forum uh, where we could produce and publish quality peer-reviewed articles, but where the Pakistani scholars could themselves also add their voice to uh, all that was coming out of North America and Europe about Pakistan. Uh, so, the, so when I was thinking about it, in the, at the back of my mind was that it had to be an open access journal because I was going to launch the journal in the name of Pakistani people. And so the, there was no point in launching a very controlled content journal, uh, which the very people in whose name it was being uh, offered to the world could not afford. So there was no question in my mind that it was going to be an open access journal. I just didn't know how to do it. The model was very simple. I had previously published in post-colonial text. Those of you who know, John Wilinski wrote the code uh, for uh, open journal systems. And when he wrote the code, post-colonial text was the first journal that was launched using John Wilinski's code. So that, that was a historical journal. And that was what was my model. That's how I wanted to uh, model my journal. Uh, it kind of looks like this. So it's the same um, uh, you know, landing page that you get in open journal systems. Uh, we have published quite a few issues so far. You can see. Uh, I'll have to figure out how to go back to my presentation. Uh, um, so the mission is very simple. So how did we launch it? Okay, so first of all, the idea was um, to, a general description, a two-paragraph description of the journal. So I wrote it, showed it to my friends. So basically, we came up with this kind of a mission statement, which uh, and at the back of my mind was supposed to be uh, on the front landing page of the journal, that it's a refereed journal, that it's a multidisciplinary journal, and that it's an open access journal. And there is a logic to putting these terms there, because anyone writing in Pakistan who's trying to submit an article, they're basically looking for peer-reviewed journals. And most of the times, probably, they work in a cross-disciplinary, multidisciplinary field. So that was the second term that we wanted to define the journal with, and of course, then the third, open access. So these three uh, attributive terms are very instructive in the mission of the journal, which also made sure that eventually, if the journal gets successful, we couldn't make it into a control content journal without altering the mission. Uh, and so uh, that was the brief mission statement that we used. And then uh, how, what's our publication model? We publish three um, issues a year. And that's kind of on the traditional lines. Instead of doing one continuous issue, uh, we do three issues a year. Uh, our online version is fully open access, immediate open access. Uh, and then we also, of course, registered ourselves as a print journal. And we make our print version available through a print-on-demand publisher. So the, mo the, the week we publish our online version, we prepared the same files according to the parameters of our print-on-demand publisher. We just dump the cover and the files there, and within 10 minutes, the print version is ready. Um, and it, it, it has its own page. We do it through a commercial print-on-demand publisher, which costs us nothing. Uh, all the issues can be purchased both in digital form as well as in... Uh, print form through their website. So the problem that we have with that is, uh, you know, most of the times what we would sell is, uh, is uh, I still don't know how to get back, but I will. Uh, most of the sales that we have are mostly vanity sales. You know, an author has published with us. They want a copy that they can show to someone. Uh, but still, we do sell some copies. Uh, to people. 
And then uh, the software that we run our journal on is, of course, open journal systems. So this is our publication model uh, in terms of both online and print versions. But I'm coming to the um, important things. So before we launched the journal, uh, these were some of the considerations. I mean, where would the funding come from? Uh, I mean, I might need some money to launch the journal. Uh, who would host the journal and what kind of technical support we would need. Now, when I launched the journal in 2009, we had no institutional commitment. No one had promised me that, you would, uh, that they would you know, give us some money. So the entire editorial staff and everyone else were volunteers. We looked online for a, a hosting company. Pretty much the main hosting companies, the, the one PKP and others, they charge a lot of money, about $1,200 to host a journal. Uh, we found one company which was called Scholarly Exchange. It has now been bought out by Uni University of Pittsburgh. Uh, this was launched by three uh, physicians. Julian Fisher, who was a neurosurgeon, and two others, three doctors, had launched this company. Uh, and the best thing was they would give you one year free. So you could launch your journal and have one year free hosting. And if your journal made it, after that, you were supposed to pay $850 a year to host the journal. Uh, so, of course, we went with those who were going to host us for free. So they were great. They helped us set up the journal and everything, and they provided us enough technical support. Uh, of course, meanwhile, that forced me to start learning coding and all the other stuff because that's how my mind works. Too. Uh, I mean, I'm a socialist, but I'm also a libertarian. So, you know, I want to be individually capable of doing things. So. So these were three main considerations, funding, the hosting of the journal, and then the technical support. And the second important thing was, how do you establish a journal about Pakistan? Uh, you know, what are the steps we took? So of course, we, uh, I went and contacted everyone affiliated with Pakistan studies all over the world. Okay. Scholars from here. Uh, scholars from France, England, Australia, and I requested them, you know, a, a, an email saying, this is what we are trying to do. Would you like to be on our editorial board? It won't require you to do anything, but we would just seek your guidance as the general progresses. So within the first or two weeks of launching our website, we had pretty much everyone who's anyone in Pakistan studies on our editorial board. Now, these are not members of our editorial team, but they are our advisory board. Now, that gave us some legitimacy, because when anyone comes to our website and looks at it, the first thing they are going to look at, where is the journal house? So it's affiliated with a university. And who's on their editorial board? You know, are there any big names? Uh, Catherine Ewing from Duke. And, you know, Anita West from Oregon, people who, who write about Pakistan and stuff like that. The editorial team, of course, then had to be section editors. So if I am the editor and I'm also editing the article section of the journal, I needed uh, a review editor. I needed, uh, I went and recruited a review editor from France who was interested in Pakistan studies, uh, a creative nonfiction editor, a poetry editor and an Urdu editor, because we were going to accept submissions in Urdu as well. So, so we had a full editorial team. And then volunteer copy editors and uh, proofreaders. And then finally, a layout editor who would lay the issue out in, in the final version before we published it. So we, had, we created that full team. Then we created a whole list of reviewers, any article that we get who would we send it to and ask them to uh, allow us to send them one or two articles a year. So by the time we launched the journal, we had about 50 people who had agreed to review articles for us. Now we have about 250 people review articles for us. Then uh, was launching the journal, sending our calls for papers. So we used every list, you know, Penn State list, humanities, digital list, university email uh, systems, uh, lists uh, of different organizations just to 
send our first call for papers. And then we immediately started looking towards indexing the journal. So, you know, we listed the journal with Ulrich and others because it's easier. All they need is uh, an, an intent to publish and information. But we immediately also contacted MLA and other uh, indexing, social sciences indexing uh, companies and started sending them our information so that by the time we start publishing, we have a history with them because when you publish with a journal, you need to see, you know, who is indexing them. Yeah. And then we used the social media. We, we created uh, a Facebook page for the journal and made sure that people know about it and made sure that they you know, go there to get their information. And then uh, the most important step, I think, which made us successful was creating an affiliated blog with the journal. Uh, so the blog is called the Pakistan Forum. And it, it was started as a simple blog, but then it became a multi-author blog because we started getting submissions from, uh, you know, people like uh, the former ambassador to Pakistan, people like Tariq Ali, uh, Parvez Hoodboy, who's a big peace activist in, uh, in Pakistan. So the blog kind of eventually became so prominent that it now sends people to the journal. So these were some of the tools... Uh, uh, that we used uh, uh, to, before even publishing, you know, a single issue, to create a digital footprint of a promising journal which is coming up, uh, which has applied for indexation, which has a good editorial board and good editorial team. And that eventually took us to our first issue. And after we launched the first issue, uh, which was very successful, I think we have had about, so far, about 5,000 downloads of our first issue. Then, then we were set, because after that, all we had to do was publish on time and just make sure that we get in, we get in touch with it. Now the question then was the second year of payment for the hosting fee. I'm still talking about the first year. Um, so I was at Kent State then. So the second year, I went to my chair. Of course, that's what you do if you're a junior assistant professor. As we say in Urdu, you know, like when a, when a mullah wants to do something, what does he do? He runs to the mosque, right? So same in an English department, you go to your chair. So my chair was kind, and, kind enough. He gave me some money. And I put some of my own money into it. And for the first two or three years, that's how we worked. Uh, and then we applied for a small grant to American Institute of Pakistan Studies. And American Institute of Pakistan Studies uh, didn't have an in-house journal. They had an affiliated journal called Annual of Urdu Studies, which had been in publication for 25 years. Uh, the journal eventually had to close because they didn't transition from a print publication to a digital publication. Uh, so they were looking for a journal that they could call, this is the journal affiliated with us. So they reviewed us and they decided to give us a small grant. And that's all we needed to cover our costs. Uh, and then eventually, you know, I moved to UNT and so UNT was more supportive of the project. I'll just still figure it out. And uh, so now what we do is last year, instead of giving $1,000 a year to Penn State, uh, we decided to take the next step and we started to decided to self-host the journal. Now the problem with hosting online journals for those who are not funded by institutions isn't that you cannot pay the hosting costs. You know, most of us who have websites can afford to pay for them. The problem is that none of them would give you a monthly payment plan. So they want their $1,000 in one payment, which most of the times we do not have. So when I created our own hosting account, thankfully this company, uh, using the international reach of digital media, because this company is based in Sweden, their technicians are from Russia, but they're good. You tell them, I want this program launched, and can you debug it? Within 15 minutes, they had launched open journal systems for me. 
and we migrated the journal. So now we pay about $20 a month for our hosting fee. That means we never have to worry about funding. Uh, so these are some of the steps that we took. Um, where do I go? Sorry. I'm supposed to be good at these things, but... That's what, I think that's what Macintosh does. It makes us increasingly ineffective with any other technology. So where are we now? Uh, we are now in our sixth year of publication. Uh, we have consistently published on time. And uh, what has worked for us, since we rely, we want to attract Pakistani authors, of course. I mean, it's their venue. Uh, we've had some problems with that because the Higher Education Commission of Pakistan changed their policy of indexing journals, and they now want us to be indexed by um, the web of, not the web of science, but their social sciences branch. And if you have ever had to deal with them, they tend to be very conservative in give indexing you because they are looking at your citations, and if you don't have a history of citations, you can't really become uh, one of their index journals. And so because of that, the number of uh, submissions that are coming from Pakistan have decreased because these people have to publish in two foreign journals uh, in order to apply for tenure. And if those journals are not listed with Higher Education Commission, then they don't get credit for it. Uh, but other than that, we have been very successful. Uh, we've done two special issues, one on 1971 war, uh, which was really successful because uh, Dr. Nictor and uh, his colleague from Texas A&M, these are the people who had done the Nixon tapes project. They, for our 1971 war issue, they gave us original materials from their archive where Nixon is talking to his aides about the 1971 war in Pakistan. So we, we are the only journal, actually, that published those materials. Then last year, we published sort of probably one of the best issues on Faz Ahmed Faz because it was his centennial, the greatest Pakistani uh, socialist poet, won a Lenin Award, and uh, a scholar from England, uh, University of London, worked with us. So what, what we have learned is that you know, publishing an online, digital, uh, open access journal is, is uh, because of the technologies that are available, it, it allows you to reach out to a global um, list of experts, writers. There are no barriers to that. And you can tap into that, that energy and the materials that come. Uh, now, of course, I'm a humanist, so I, I don't look at market as the motivator of our actions. I, I don't look at market-driven driven or supply-side solutions. I'm not in uh, of our do macroeconomics, but so my, I always think in terms of what do we do as human beings, right? And most of the times, you know, there is a physical material economy outside that motivates our actions, but there is also a huge symbolic economy. Well, that symbolic economy makes it possible for Oxford to publish my book, right, and sell the first 5,000 reprint in six months and do three more reprints and give me 6% in royalties, right? And that too, like, when they feel like sending it to me. But the symbolic economy made it possible for me, plus my responsibilities to get tenure, is forget about royalties, publish my book, it's Oxford University Press, you know, my chair would be dancing in his, would think I'm a really cool scholar. So, so, I mean, so that means that we sometimes work for symbolic capital. We sometimes work, people review our articles because they feel honored that we ask them or they feel honored because they are being included in a conversation. And these are all intangible factors. And in order to run an open access journal, we have to rely on that. We can't just think in terms of money and how we are going to pay for it. We have to rely on the goodwill of people. And I can say over the last six years, I've been humbled as to how many people 
graduate students and uh, faculty members, scholars in the field have, in, have help, helped this project. And, and that's why I never call it my own project because it sort of is a collective project of all the people involved in it. And what needs to be changed is fairly, I think, we need some young, more young scholars to join us. Uh, we need to replace members of our editorial team, but these are small things. Uh, in, we're, we are an established journal. We are the only peer-reviewed journal that covers social sciences and humanities on Pakistan. Uh, and. Uh, I think what all we need to change is just keep, make sure that we keep engaging young people uh, part of our project. I know it's not really a very impressive presentation, but I'll be happy to answer some questions after that. Thank you so much.